Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the Bull City Coordinators Duke Football Coverage Podcast. Check us out on our website, bullcitycoordinators.com. You can find us anywhere you get your podcasts. We're on the socials at Duke FB Coverage. Check out our YouTube channel. And as you know, we are now part of the College Huddle Network. So hopefully th- there will be some more collaborations with fellow members this season. But it is almost that time of year where we forego, forsake, forget everything other than college football, and we devote our Saturdays to ignoring our family, our loved ones, and everything else that matters in the name of watching our team try and win and getting inexplicably angry over over a game played by 18 to, well, now maybe up to 27-year-olds with the COVID madness. And the real question On everybody's mind is how are our beloved Blue Devils going to do this season? And there is only one person who can get us ready for this season that I now have season tickets for and purchased a parking pass. I got a really sweet Block D lapel pin in the mail from my boys at the Iron Dukes. How about them apples? There you go. Very excited. Who is going to break this season down for us? Well, it is returning guest, the most legendary college football walk-on of all time. (laughs) It was a close race between him and Carl's, but you know what? Touchdown against Florida State notwithstanding, this man (laughs) moved to the head of the line. It is none other than fellow attorney Lee Rodeo. Lee, how are you doing, man? How you doing, boss man? Great to be back with you, Ben. I am doing fantastic. Thanks for coming back. Uh, educate us on what you've been up to since last season. What all's been going on? Man, well, you know, it's been pretty quiet. Um, yeah, all I, you know, all I did was uh, pass the bar, get engaged, start working uh, as an attorney, which is still weird to say. Um, but yeah, beyond that, not not a lot's been going on. Um, no, life's been great. I uh, just been incredibly blessed. A um, lot of lot of incredible experiences and wonderful people. Very little of which had anything to do with me, other than just uh, having the dumb luck to find myself in good circumstances. So, um, you know, I I can't 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 express enough how how wonderful life has been over the past year. So, great to be back with you, and ho- hope the same for your crew. We're doing great here, and everybody should know Lee is engaged to a Roanoke girl. Is that right? Indeed. Yes, sir. All right. Well, I know Chris Combs, if he's listening, he's going to be excited about that. So, And a a Cave Spring High School grad like like, uh, J.J. Reddick. Well, as I said with Steve Weissman, J.J., if you're listening, don't (laughs) get too secure in L.A. The odds are not in your favor. (laughs) I think while we all respect LeBron James' dominance on the basketball court, we all understand what that means for his head coaches. <laughs> I mean, it's an interesting approach, you know. I mean, it's the Steve Kerr model. Pick a, you know, short, skinny white guy that can shoot threes and hope for the best, you know. So we'll we'll see. Well, uh, one thing I do need to mention since you mentioned Cave Spring is – Tim, my good friend Tim, who is one of the original drinking team coordinators, taught at Cave Spring for a while. So he's going to be excited to hear about this. And we can figure out later if uh, she had Tim as a teacher. But enough of that. We got to get everybody ready for the season. So what we're going to do, folks, we're going to go through the schedule. And it'll be interesting to see what happens when we get to that four-week murderer's row stretch between October 12 and November 16. Uh, But we're going to go through each game one by one, get a win-loss prediction, and then just overall thoughts on the records. I will keep track, and we will see where we are at the end of the day. So with that being said, let's start with August 30 against Elon at Wallace Wade. Who you got? Well, I'm going to pull a politician's answer here real quick and give you an answer that has nothing to do with the question you asked. And just want to point out that to all your loyal listeners um, who who I'm sure remember this, last year there was a a particular uh, season kickoff game. It was something weird, like a Monday night, played some kind of 
some private school in South Carolina, uh, Citadel, Clemson, something. Um, and, uh, and, 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 you know, I seem to remember there being a little bit of, you know, maybe some consternation or disbelief that I unironically predicted that we would win. And I just want to point out, you know, the, it, 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 it's not a matter of hindsight. It's 50, 50, go check the tape. <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying, if you're putting money on futures, listen to what Lee has to say. Okay, guys. <laughs> That uh that that said and and no shade to Elon but I uh, I I do think that we will uh, we will not have a hard time um, repeating that uh, that season opening win tradition that we have gotten going in the Duke football uh, uh, culture in years past so I think we will uh, send the Phoenix home uh, to Elon North Carolina with an unfortunate loss on the record. I agree with that, and it's looking like I'm not going to be able to make the Elon game, folks. So I may have two tickets. If anybody needs tickets, hit me up, send me a message, tweet at me, whatever. And I've still got to confirm with my brother whether he can or can't make it. So we may have two tickets coming, uh, come available. So happy to make those available so we can pack that house for game one of of the Manny Diaz era now week two interesting week all right september 6 against northwestern 9 p.m eastern ryan field evanston illinois is that right i gotta check that that's what it says here on the schedule i thought they were playing somewhere else regardless duke goes on the road to play big 10 foe northwestern these teams are very familiar with each other who you got and why I actually really like this game, and I really am excited that it's here because I think it's the perfectly situated um, kickoff to not only get us some unfamiliar territory, but also some you know bona fide competition, and definitely in a style that is not necessarily the norm for what we see in the ACC. You know, Northwestern doesn't usually fall in the same you know caliber of um, you know, the, the echelon upper echelons of football is, you know, the Michigans and the Penn States of the world, but it was even, you know, even back when I was on the team, you could, it, you could tell that just the way their team was built, it was a very decidedly big 10 team, um, you know, giant offensive line, uh, very, you know, as opposed to throwing, slinging the ball around, uh, even as much as people do today, it's still very based off the run, um, looking to, you know, the, 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 you can tell their 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 priority is to be physical with you, and then everything else is come what may. So I do like this. I also like the fact for Duke that it is on a Friday. Also, um, you get in that seven day rotation. It's a little bit easier to you know get in the swing of things. It's it's not a shock to the system like a Thursday night game. Um, so I do like Duke for the win here. Um, it will definitely not be as easy as uh, as the opening week, um, given the you know FCS versus Power Five competition. But I do think we take home the win, and I think it's a great opportunity to get work out some kinks and uh, really see what the Manny Diaz system is going to be about. All right, and I did check; it is not going to be at Ryan Field. I thought that was correct because of some construction that's being done there. So it is going to be at a uh, temporary. Yeah, facility yeah, they're weird temporary like you know i saw the thing the other day the tickets there's so few tickets the tickets are like 175 dollars or something well uh we will see how that plays out so i am you know i was going to go on full disclosure i was going to take northwestern before i listened to you my thought being Malik Murphy and the o-line and everybody still needs to gel but then i started thinking to myself well Northwestern's not going to have as much film on what Duke wants to do. So I think that will work to the advantage of the Blue Devils, and I think that they are going to steal a win. I'm going to go with the Blue Devils. Lee, you have talked me into it. We both have them undefeated going back home Saturday, September 14th at Wallace Wade against the UConn Huskies. Who you got? So, you know, I think this is going to be an interesting game. Um, if for no other reason, then I think a lot of people will will look at the game the following week as a classic trap game. Um, you know, I think uh, that 
if I'm honest, I think between the two, I think this might be a bigger trap game just because it um, it sort of falls in a, you know, a energy trough. Um, you sort of get ebbs and flows of engagement energy, you know, throughout the season. It, it even happens in the NFL. It's not, you know, n- nobody's immune to it. We're all human. Um, it's just, you know, you, you get so hyped for the start of the season that carries you through the first two weeks. Then, you know, it's a little bit a little bit of time before you pick back up for, you know, major conference opponents um, coming coming midway through the season. So I think it helps that this is in Durham. Um, and I think as far as getting up for the game, um, you know, it, UConn presents some interesting uh, challenges. Um, but like you said, I think in the same dynamic as Northwestern, it's a, it's an opponent we're familiar with. And I think we've got a lot more film on them than they do on us. I think that plays to our favor. And I think, you know, do uh, given that we don't know a lot about how the, you know, new administration is going to mesh on the field, do it in no small part to, you know, a little bit of a physical mismatch. I see Duke taking this one. I'm going to agree with you. And I also think, and everybody who's listening, take a moment, knock on wood, find your head if you got nothing else. But if, the O-line stays healthy by this game, week three, that unit should start to gel. We lost a lot of leadership last year, a lot of seniors, but we this is a weird mix of an age team. It's not like a lot of the – after that one group left with Goldsmith and he was completely restarting with just a bunch of young guys, there's some veteran leadership here. So I think – and Jim Moore is a good coach at UConn. I'm not saying that, you know, he's a disaster or anything like that, and this will be an easy one. But to your point, the physical mismatch, week three, we should see some gelling on that line. Things should come together. And I think that Duke's going to win this one. Uh, they'll they'll be at home. And I think it should be a comfortable win. So I'm going to take the Blue Devils, and we both have them undefeated, headed – back on the road on September 21 to Johnny Red Floyd Stadium at Murfreesboro, Tennessee. The, the play. Bustling Do what? The bustling metropolis of Murfreesboro. Hey, man. You know, uh, I grew up, well, well, anyway, we won't go into that story, but mo- most everywhere is bigger than where I grew up. So we got the Middle Tennessee Blue Raiders will host the Blue Devils 7 p.m., at night, exciting game. Who you got? You know, I, I actually like this too, given the circumstances of the game. Also, just before we get completely off the topic, I did. I believe I did see. Um, I think Jim Mora had been coordinating. Uh, I believe was is functionally serving as the offensive coordinator for UConn, and stepped away from those duties only a week or two ago. Um, so I think they might also be dealing with some institutional change there too, uh, as far as just getting the flow of the game. So. Look, I, I think that'll play, you know, just it, it can't not play a certain amount of, uh, you know, influence in how their season progresses. But um, moving on to Middle Tennessee, yeah, no, I think, uh, you know, this is, you know, as as a walk on, you know, we're not the first to get our travel orders, but I can speak from experience. This is one of the few games I did travel for uh, back in the uh, fall of 2019 um, uh, under the leadership of uh, Mr. Quentin Harris. Um, who had, I believe, one of the had one of the better games for a Duke quarterback in program history, uh, in under the bright lights, big city, uh, Murfreesboro. Um, you know, I, I like this game. Um, number one, I, I like that it's on the road because, as far as trap games go, I think the stereotypical trap game tends to do a lot more with being at home. Um, you know, it's it's you draw a certain amount of energy from an opposing crowd. And one thing you can say about middle Tennessee, their crowd's going to be, you know, into the game. It's one of those stadiums where it's small. It's sort of in, in the sense, sort of in the same vein as while it's weight. It's small enough that, you know, the, the crowd is not removed from you. Like they're right there. Um, you know, you can get, you, you can draw some juice from that. Um, and sort of on the opposite end of the spectrum is Northwestern. This will give Duke a great opportunity to see how they stack up against a team that's going to throw the ball all over the field, run and gun. Middle Tennessee was one of the first programs to pioneer the West Coast offense over here um, among us East Coast, you know, I-formation uh, purists. 
Um, so it'll be, a, it'll be a good opportunity. I think it's a really respectable program. Um, I don't think we should take them lightly. I don't get the sense that Duke will take them lightly. Um, and given the atmosphere surrounding the game, with it being a Saturday night, um, you know, we'll probably be, you know, held on decently interesting, um, you know, regional TV. Um, and, and, I, and I think the other thing about it is, too, when, when, a, when a game becomes this much of an obvious trap game, just the psychological effect in the locker room is that, you know, everyone's focusing on it just despite the people who say it's a trap game. Um, so I, I, I see us getting the win here too, not taking it for granted, but I do see us getting the win. I think that you are correct about that. And I think that Duke will come away with the win. It would not surprise me if it's a little choppy at first, meaning both teams are kind of getting their sea legs. Cause I think this is Derek Mason, middle Tennessee's coach. It'll, it's his first season there. He had coached at Vanderbilt, which is a very tough place to coach. So how much you can draw from that, it's it's hard to say. I looked up Quentin Harris's game against the Blue Raiders. He went a cool 24 of 27, 237 yards, four touchdowns. I think one was to Jalen Calhoun, maybe two. I can't remember. But I remember Jalen having a good night that night. So hopefully history will repeat itself. The Blue Devils will be... 4-0, undefeated, coming back home to play a team that has owned us since 2019. We will not mention the specifics of that. I don't think the game was played. They called it in the fourth quarter for some reason. I, I don't recall. It was very odd the way that ended. It was just the ref stopped it, I think. I think is what happened. Weather, who knows. Home game against the Tar Heels. I have put a team together to come to that game. We're going to come down in force, okay? My buddy Rick, Duke alum, uh, lives next door. He played for the Duke band, actually, uh, in the 90s. Nice. And we got Tim, who's an alum. We're bringing people. We're bringing everybody we could bring. Dad can't make it because he'll be recovering from another knee surgery, but he will be there in spirit. So big game, one that has me really worried, homecoming, Chance for Manny to get revenge against Mac Brown for what happened at Texas, and a chance for us to exercise the demons. Lee, who you got and why? So, you know, I I have a lot of um, conflicting inclinations about this game. Uh, not conflicting feelings at all because I'd be fine if you know the the football team that represents the university down the road never won a game again in the history in the you know. A continuum of uh, of space time, you know, however long humanity still has on the planet. Um, I think, you know, if they just went over, you know, for however long we've got left till the, you know, heat death of the universe and or, you know, nuclear Armageddon would be perfectly fine for me. Um, you know, I, I think it couldn't have happened to a nicer team. Um, and, you know, and much like, uh, you know, the general public are tending to tire of, you know, older, uh, you know, over the hill uh, leadership um, from, you know, both of our major political parties. I think, you know, that strain, that 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 particular ailment um, has struck Chapel Hill football particularly uh, um, uh, decidedly. Um, and, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, the the esteemed, um, you know, uh, Vince Young, coattail rider, does not have much time left uh, in Division One football, and I think this game will serve to uh, you know hasten that uh, exit um, for better or for worse. I think uh, this is one of those games where I think there'll be quite a few jitters, um, or at least have the potential to be. But I also think it's one of those games that um, you know, so, sort of in the same way as you know, it's. It, it, it's it's one thing when both teams you know have an equal ex expectation of victory it's another thing when you sort of get that there it, it's it's just never so slight cultural change but there's that there's there's something to be said for the one team that just knows they're due um and i think that there has been enough institutionalized you know winning culture that has been cultivated in durham um you know jokes aside 
uh, yeah, I think these guys not only, you know, feel like I, 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 it's the difference between feeling like you deserve it because oftentimes you lose because you don't feel like, you know, you, it's an entitled feeling. These guys are hungry for it. They're desperate for it. Um, you know, I, I know for a fact that Trey Freeman doesn't want to end his career in Durham without beating the guys in, in, in baby blue um, and bringing the bell back where it belongs. So I, I see, I unironically see this as a win. My feelings about UNC football aside, um, I think Carolina has lost a good amount of talent. Um, I think they have been, um, you know, flying along on the, you know, wings of Drake May, who I will admit is a generational player. Um, same with Sam Howell, great players. I mean, you know, they, they make the game of football better. But I think they have, in the same way that Lamar Jackson prolonged Bobby Petrino's career, I think Sam, Sam Howell and Drake May prolonged Mac Brown's and, you know, Sam Howell and Drake May ain't walking through that door. So. I'm going to take the Blue Devils, too, if for no other reason than I will never pick Carolina. Preach it, I, sister. I, w- I will say it's going to be an interesting game. I think we are catching Carolina at the right time, meaning early before that group has a chance to gel. But I do want to point out one thing. When you said ride the coattails, I thought you were going to talk about ride the coattails of an easy schedule. Georgia Tech. Yeah, Georgia Tech, which we'll talk about in a second, could be one of the best teams in the ACC. The Yellow Jackets have an insane schedule. Syracuse plays like nobody. But yep. let's just go through real quick. I did that already with the Heald brothers as part of a college huddle collaboration. Minnesota, wake me up when something happens. Who cares? Charlotte, that whole thing has kind of, since they beat us, it's kind of been downhill. All right. One of my favorite coaches in Division One football, though. What a guy. I, <laughs> I, I, get, I get it. I get it. <laughs> but – Victory isn't how you define the parameters, and in football, it's through actual victory. So he's got yeah. a little bit of trouble. <laughs> um, North Carolina Central, the team will be well coached, but that's going to be a win for Carolina. Yeah, James Madison at Carolina. If that were on the road, that'd be a different game. Then they they play Duke, Pitt, Georgia Tech, Virginia, Florida State, Wake, Boston College, North Carolina State. Only two teams ranked preseason other than that a fairly easy schedule and i know you can say well look duke only plays three ranked teams but also has georgia tech on there and i'm sorry northwestern got to a bowl game last year after looking dead in the water that's a better team probably than a lot of people think you know that unit's going to be well coached and smu could surprise a lot of people so Carolina's benefiting from an insanely, insanely easy schedule. And to go back to Georgia Tech, Florida State, Notre Dame, at Virginia Tech, my, I mean, okay, Miami, sure, whatever. But <laughs> NC State and Georgia, that is a brutal schedule. And Louisville, somehow I missed Louisville, okay? I mean, I'm just saying Carolina – has a much easier schedule, and this is one thing that is going to frustrate fans going forward. But enough about that. Let's go to game six. All right? Yep, and actually, it's so funny that you went down that line of discussion because actually I was exact. I was just about to say, I think these two teams, as much as it pains me to admit, you know, full strength, head-to-head, I think Georgia Tech is the better team. I, I would be very surprised if Georgia Tech was at full strength by this point in the season. Um, you know, they, you know, they, I believe they, you know, they only kick off with Florida state. And then like you right. said, they've got Syracuse, um, you know, they, it, it, in, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, it, it, it's kind of sound, it comes across as a little bit, you know, simplistic to dumb it down this much, but there is something to be said for the fact that your body deteriorates faster, the larger human beings you're running headfirst into more frequently. And I think there's something to be said for the fact that although they are, you know, Division One programs, um, UConn and Middle Tennessee are not Power Five programs and tend to not, you know, be the same caliber of athletic competition, game in and game out. You know, that's not that's not taking anything away from them. Um, and also, you know, to your point about trap games, you know, in the way that Middle Tennessee, I think, 
is almost too much of a trap game. I think the James Madison game for Carolina is the classic trap game um, for all the wrong reasons. But I, I, I'm going to pick Duke uh, over Georgia Tech because in spite of the fact I think Georgia Tech is probably more talented team, I think Duke is better positioned to be playing at, uh, you know, hitting on all cylinders at this point in the season. I think Georgia Tech would be very lucky to get this far without losing a key piece. I'm going to take Georgia Tech in that game. A lot of it has to do with the fact that I just – I think that, one, that coach is very good. I think it's a very well-coached team. They're very tough. They know their identity. And if you're unable to kneel out to win a game, Georgia Tech will find a way to take advantage of that. But also, it's a tough start for the Yellow Jackets. Florida State, Georgia State, on the road against Syracuse – at home against VMI, I mean, so you're looking two, maybe your first four, three and one, two and two. On the road to Louisville, that probably is going to be a loss, maybe not, but then a bye week before you get the Blue Devils at home. So I think the bye week will help, and then you play Duke at home. I just don't see the Blue Devils starting six, six and oh, although, boy, I hope I'm wrong. So I'm going to go with Georgia Tech and – you have the Blue Devils undefeated after six games. I have the Blue Devils at five and one. We come into a bye week, got to win the bye week, and then pick it back up on October 18th, a Friday night against Florida State, 7 p.m. ESPN 2. The Devils' deck is going to be just rocking. <laughs> <laughs> the structural integrity will be challenged. Um, Absolutely. So was... <laughs> what what do we got? <laughs> that was a little nerve wracking seeing the pictures of it going up. I, I assumed it would be a little more substantial construction than it turned out to be. But, um, you know, bear with me here because uh, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to sort of give a Duke Clemson answer. But, um, you know, I think the key to this game will not necessarily be, um, you know, the fact that it's Duke that Florida State's coming into town to face, don't not take anything away from my guys. But um, it, it would be worth noting that in the weeks immediately preceding the Duke game, Florida State is uh, got Clemson at home and then in Dallas to face SMU. That is a hell of a one-two punch. Um, and, you know, in the same way that, you know, Dabo Sweeney is famous for not starting the season incredibly well. Um, and I think that played into Duke's hands last year. I think uh, Florida State, when presented with a tough stretch, um, you know, when they can build up to a big opponent, I think they're great under Mike Norvell. Um, I think when they come off this tough stretch, especially with the, um, you know, the having to prepare, you know, all – and granted, you know, not technically seen as a general perennial power, but having to prepare for the different Cal style as well in the season and then having to account for SMU's run and shoot, um, uh, you know, I, I think they're going to be tired. I think they're going to be, you know, you know, pretty well worn down. And I think, you know, like it or not, Wallace Wade, when it wants to be, is not the easiest place to play. Um. So it is uh it's it's I, I, I'm not trying to be a homer here when I say I think Duke wins this game. Wow. Man, I love it. I love it. I love you're putting, you know, you're putting my dad to shame. Uh I'm gonna take FSU in that game. Both teams have buys coming into it. I'm just not sure yet. I might have a different thought later in the season watching the team progress. But if I have to go today, I've got to go with FSU. I've, I'm actually toying around of changing my podcast format to do one episode at the beginning of the season, then one after the first three games, after six, after nine, after 12, just so we can talk a little bit more about how the team progresses. I, but I, I'm not sure how it's going to play out. Uh, I think we'll know a lot more about this team the Blue Devils after the Georgia Tech game. Carolina and the Georgia Tech game, those two together are going to be critical. But as of today, I'm going to go with the Seminoles. And I'm just going to say this. They're not on our schedule, so I'll just say it. Am I the only one who thinks Clemson's a little bit overrated right now? 
I mean, I mean, everybody's talking to them like they're back, like Clemsoning is over, and we're never going to talk about it again. I'm just saying they didn't look that great last year. Yeah, no, I, I, I this may be a hot take, but I don't. I don't see what they did to bounce back. Like, that's where, I, I, yeah, that's where I am. I mean, you don't when you don't play the transfer portal in this day and age. I don't care how much juice you've got in the recruiting game. Um, I, I can only imagine that you know if he's if he's this opposed to the transfer portal that Dabo Sweeney is not you know leaning into NIL with his whole heart, uh, which you've pretty much got no choice but to do. Um, I. I you know, I, I may be wrong, but, you know, college football coaches can be prideful people. And it's, you know, I think Dabo Sweeney might be reaching the point where he's believing his own hype and, you know, only he has the solution. Um, and that is a particularly fateful place to wind up. So, I mean, I, I don't, I don't see Clemson. I mean, granted, you know, they may like, I, Seven and five is a respectable season in Durham, but I don't think the you know whatever their little acronym fans are uh, will be particularly thrilled with that. It's so a we'll crowd, yeah. And I can't remember where Tyler, the guy who called in, was from. What what city or town in South Carolina? But if Clemson struggles this year, there will be a lot more Tyler's calling in to the coach's radio show. Let's skip ahead to. SMU, the Mustangs come to town on October 26. They will visit Wallace Wade Stadium. They will meet the Blue Devils. Where? Uh, give us your prediction on this one. You have you have the team undefeated after seven games. So you know, I this one is sort of hard to gauge just because I I do feel like SMU is classically hard to gauge i mean i feel like they're one of those teams sort of like houston you know any given season you feel like you turn on the tv and oh they're you know competing for um whatever conference they're coming the conference championship you know or oh they're competing to not miss a bowl game you know it's it's sort of a the wild wild west in every sense of the word um, and if for no other reason than the fact that i as a proud uh wesleyan and a uh everlasting champion of of duke university's place in the methodist tradition i will say in the in the battle of the methodist schools i, I will take duke in this for you know purely um sectarian and uh ethno religious re- religious reasons well you have you have a reason you've backed it up it makes perfect sense to me i'm all in favor of it i think it's going to be an interesting game in large part because these program or the coaches know each other real well. There's a lot of ties back and forth between Diaz and the folks at SMU. Coach Brewer, you know, obviously has ties to both, but I think it was the Big J Little J podcast that pointed this out. Last season, you can throw the Oklahoma game aside when SMU lost to Oklahoma, but there were also losses to TCU and to Boston College. Yeah. I know it's a bowl game, so you can say how much of that matters, but still, it's not like that was a great Boston College team. Although that was probably should have consideration for coach of the year in the ACC certainly should have been there. But TCU was not that great last year, five and seven and three and six in the Big 12. So you know, I, I do think SMU is going to cause a lot of problems for teams this year. I think it'll be very interesting to see how it plays out. But I've just got to go with the Blue Devils. I think talent-wise, the Blue Devils are a step ahead. And I think SMU, looking at their schedule coming into that, you've got this is what SMU has to do in the weeks leading up to this. TCU. Florida State at home, then on the road to Louisville by week, on the road to Stanford, and then coming from Stanford to Wallace Wade. That's a lot. I got to go with the Blue Devils. So I'm going to have Duke at this point. 
Yeah, remembering how jet lagged the guys were just coming from Baylor. Um, you know, it's it, it's a long flight, even if you're not going completely cross country. And to do the equivalent of that twice in two weeks, like that's that's a tough ask. Well, it's a good thing they're all student athletes and, uh, you know, uh, that they're yeah. completely treated fairly. And, oh. you know, there's nothing there's, there's nothing to worry <laughs> about here. Right. I mean, yep. completely academically uh, prioritized. Yeah, no. Uh, I, it, mm, yep. Nope. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> yeah, I I uh, I I don't use the term student athlete unless I'm being sarcastic or making a joke. I call them students. Uh, because we, I have issues with the term student athlete. So when you hear me use it, no, there's a reason for it. <laughs> All right. Now, this is an interesting game next on November 2nd. We've been told again that the U is back. And Duke will go to the U in front of 3,000 hardcore Miami fans, all of which are boosters probably, to play there. We remember what happened the last time, which was just glorious. Just glorious. Shades of Dion breaking the U over his knee. Who do you have winning this game and why? So, you know, I... Th this will be a little bit uh, heavier on the, you know, overarching, you know, uh, view of the season versus, um, you know, specifically in-game analysis. Um, I think this is a prime example of, uh, you know, even when they're bad, like actually, you know, my, the last game of my career was against, you know, Manny Diaz coached, you know, Miami and they were flat out bad. I mean, they were unmotivated. They were, you know, we were beating them to the spot. You know, we weren't that good that year, especially at that point in the season, but you know, they just, and even then it wasn't a blowout just because at, you know, base level, you know, they've just got, you know, horses on that side of the field. I mean, it, they, I mean, they, for better or for worse, Miami's going to get some good athletes. And I think at this point in the season, this is a, you know, both historically for Duke and also just the nature of football. I think this is a prime, uh, you know, location for a first loss. Um, you know, I think it is a, uh, I don't, I don't foresee it being a catastrophic loss. It might be pretty close. Um, but, you know, in the same way that, you know, people have pointed out in the past that Wallace Wade is tough to play in sometimes because, you know, especially for schools that, you know, a, that are used to a much more electric environment. I think the, um, that has shifted somewhat. Uh, and, you know, it is, there's something to be said for the fact it's hard to play in front of a lot of empty seats. And one thing you can say about Miami at home is that you're going to be playing in front of a lot of empty seats. So I will I will say this I will say the the hurricanes come out on top in this one. What worries me about this game is only Cam Ward. Yeah. The Miami quarterback. I saw more of him than I expected on TV last year, mainly because I don't watch a lot of West Coast teams. He can play. Yep. I don't think that Cristobal can coach. I don't think that's a surprise to anybody that I'm saying that. I mean, we all saw the kneel down. <laughs> I remember Joe Opie's talking about that on, on the podcast afterward and explaining, he's like, yeah, my dad was cussing in Spanish. And I just, <laughs> I, I feel like, not to talk about <laughs> feelings, but my gut tells me this could be a pretty close game. Yeah. And, and, and I'm torn on it because, in a close game, Cam Ward could elevate Miami to the top. But also, Cristobal could just completely anchor, you know, anchor down the Hurricanes. Yep. I'm, I'm torn on this one. It's on the road. But, you know, I, I'm going to... I'm going to go a little bit out of what I'd plan to pick. I'm just going to say somehow Duke finds a way to win this game. And so I'm going to go, it's a revenge game for Diaz too, to the extent that he plays into that, which I'm sure that he will. Yeah. Most coaches would. So I'm going to take Duke to win a close one, seven, get to seven and two on the season, but it would not surprise me if that game goes the other way at all. It 
and I think I think this actually also might be you know it one of the it, it's hard it's another one of those you know truisms it's hard to sort of articulate in a way that would make a lot of you know functional sense um but one of those and, and it sounds incredibly simple but it's also you know a lot more intuitive than you know the, lay, the average layperson would would assume one of the determinants of those sort of big time programs a difference you know I, i'll the the story i always love is um when we went to Notre Dame my freshman year, um, I say we, I was on the team, but I absolutely was not on the travel squad um, and, and pulled off that win. Uh, I was remember talking to Kobe Kwanzaa later that week at practice. And we were, and of course we were both true freshmen and he had um, gotten in the game for a few snaps and um, was talking about how, uh, you know, even though we played a couple, you know, we were a few games into the season he said, man, those linemen were different. He said, he said, I came on a blitz. And he said, this guy was so big. He didn't even, he said, he didn't even look at me. I was bearing down full speed. He just puts his arm out and takes me off my feet completely. Not even like a, not even a wholehearted block. Just, he's, you know, he's, he's helping the guy next to him, happens to catch me just right. And he's so big and strong. He took Kobe completely off his feet. And like, and, and that is such a great example of the true, you know, determinant of, you know, the upper, you know, the Alabamas of the world versus the Auburns of the world is, I think, is a way to, good way to put it. The caliber of linemen that they get, um, the offensive linemen and, you know, their effect on the team around them um, in terms of, you know, where your baseline is on your worst day, if you've got a good offensive line, you can win a football game. Um, and a good offensive line, you know, lets you sort of spread the wealth in terms of, you know, what you can and can't do. Um, you know, it, 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 if everything were to go wrong, the greatest determining factor is, you know, the guys with the hand on the ground. And one thing you, you can't, you know, take away from Miami is even when they have sort of been in the wilderness by their standards, they have always put out good linemen. I mean, I, I'm I'm remembering, um, you know, Casey McDermott, their big left tackle from when I was in school. One of the largest human beings I've ever seen in my life. Might not have been one of the tallest, uh, you know. He, I mean, although he was, I think, like six five, um, but just truly just a mass of humanity. Uh, and that's, and and I say all that to say I think this is a prime example of a game where Duke's relative lack of depth on the interior defensive line will come back to bite us. Because at the end of the day, you know, if especially in a Miami game, if it rains, um, which it has been known to do in South Florida, from what I understand, um, you know, if you if you put your hand in the ground and the guy on one guy's side of the line is three hundred and thirty pounds and the other guy the guy on the other side of the line is two eighty five, it doesn't much matter how much the two eighty five guy wants it. Nature is nature, uh, and so I think this is a prime, um, you know, risk factor kind of game where a one of the you know decided uh weak spots in this team this year could come back to bite us. I will say one reason to maybe lean Duke for an upset here is this is the four week stretch that Miami is dealing with around the same time that Duke is going through its murderer's row. Uh well by week on the road against Louisville at home against Florida State, Florida State's going to win that game. Let's just be real. They're going to dog walk them, boat race them, whatever terminology you want to use. <laughs> that may be a little bit of a stretch because Cam Ward is really good. But then they get the Blue Devils, and then they close it against Georgia Tech. And that Georgia Tech game should be big for, for the Hurricanes. So it would not surprise me if Duke comes out hits Miami in the mouth and the hurricanes are a little soft coming into the game looking ahead after dealing with two brutal weeks right before that. So we'll see, but the, the next week, I think we both might make the same prediction here. I'm going to see. Interesting. Duke, um, Duke has to go on the road against NC state. Uh, you know, I, I, one of the things that you learn growing up in this area is that, you know, as much as they hate each other, there's at least a certain amount of respect between Duke and Carolina. 
um, whether it's the institutions, whether it's the individual sports teams, whether it's the fan base, like there's a certain amount of mutual acknowledgement that, you know, I dislike you, but, you know, we've, you know, we'll, we might just as well see each other in the final four next year kind of thing. And, and the difference with state being that, you know, the sentence stops that I dislike you. Um, you know, there is very little love lost among the teams in the, in the uh, you know, academic portion of the, of the research triangle. Um, that said, as much as it pains me to say, especially coming off of, you know, uh, tussling with Miami for, you know, the, the week before and the stretch that we're coming off of, I do see this as a loss. I think State's going to be a decently robust team. I think, again, it's another one of those instances where their season's going to turn on the help of uh, a handful of guys um, that's always been a problem for them under door. And I think he's been consistent, but he's also been very reliant on, um, on key players. And it, it's, you know, state's one of those teams under door and where they could, you know, they're, uh, you know, the knife's edge away from going, you know, 10 and two or the wheels falling off. And so unfortunately I do see this also because, you know, it's Duke football. We're going to have a late season losing streak. Um, sometimes it's going to be five games. Sometimes it's going to be one, but it's going to happen. Um, and I unfortunately see this as a loss. Carter Finley is a heck of a place to pull off a win. I am. I'm going to agree with Lee on this one. And I want to go back to the point that I made about schedules earlier. If for no other reason, and look, this is, should be a good NC state team, but boy, is the schedule favorable for state Western Carolina. Tennessee in the Duke's Mayo Classic on September 7th. That should be a really good game. So you're probably saying, Bird, what are you talking about? I thought you said it was a favorable schedule. Well, Louisiana Tech after that. On the road at Clemson, but again, I'm sorry. I just don't see the Tigers being what we remember the Tigers being. Then you've got Northern Illinois, Wake Forest, Syracuse, both of those at home. Then you go on the road to play Cal by week. And then Stanford comes to town the week before the Blue Devils. And then you get the Blue... Good Lord. I didn't even. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. I mean, after then... Cal, that, that's just fun. <laughs> like... Right. So you get a bye week, then you play Man. Stanford, then you got Duke, then you got another bye week at Georgia Tech. That's a tough game. But then you Man. close it out against um, against your children, North Carolina, because Dave Doran is, is UNC's father right now. So. Indeed. I mean, that schedule, there's only two games really you have to worry about the whole season if you're State. Right. The rich get richer. All right. So we've got State. State. Well, I don't know about uh, the State being in the richer, but we'll we'll see about that. <laughs> they might be new money. We'll see. No, but if you don't believe it, just ask them. <laughs> I've never met a fan base that thinks they should win every game, but also believes they will lose every every single game they play. The <laughs> and they'll admit it. They'll be like, "Yes, we should be a ten win team every year." Yet we will lose every game. Anyway, they're like the Cubs fans of college sports. <laughs> no, no, no. The Cubs fans never expect to win anything. Though. I, I speak from experience. <laughs> believe me. Believe me. I've had all hope beaten out of me between them and the Panthers, but I don't want to get into that right now. All right, so state, you, uh, we both have state winning. I have Duke at seven and three. You have the Blue Devils at eight and two. Crucial bye week comes up. I think Duke will win that one. It'll be tough, but the Blue Devils will come out of that healthy. And then at home against Virginia Tech. Yeah, no, I. This is one of those games that it. it I mean, you can say this about every former coastal team, but like there's a special kind of, you know, here, if you're Duke, um, I think especially given Virginia Tech's recent success, maybe not the past, you know, the most most recent time, but you know, weirdly that stretch of where Duke seemed to be able to beat Tech in Blacksburg but couldn't hold a candle to him in Durham um, throughout the 2010s, I think there's a little bit of extra motivation to, to, to uh, you know, turn up in this game. I think it'll be the first game of the season where there's a decided chill in the air. 
Um, I believe we've got the, it looks like we got a bye week after state. So we've got time to regroup. You know, we're not coming at this, um, you know, at a, in, a, in a beleaguered state. So I think that bye week comes at exactly the right time. And I think there's a great motivation to cap off what I think will be a pretty darn good season with a win at home, especially against a team like Tech that travels well. I also think the Duke matches up against Tech well. I think Tech, for all their expectations, has quite a few unanswered questions. And even with um, the you know you know comparable number of transfers, I think Duke has more you know sure bets at key positions than Tech does. Um, I, you know, I will admit that I do like Tech's coaching staff. Um, I think if given the time to succeed, I think Pry is ultimately going to be the guy. But it's a question of whether or not you know a very high expectation booster club is going to give him the amount of time he needs. So um, I think this is going to this has the potential to be a really good game. Um, it is a uh, it, it Wallace Wade is going to be rocking. You know the the Tech fans always make sure of that, and I I, I hope that um, I hope it's not one of those games where Duke's having to play you know against a functionally you know a, functionally playing away game in Durham uh, because Duke fans have a tendency to you know sort of give up on the season at the first sign of a loss. Uh, but I think it's got the potential to be a great game. I think it's got the potential to be a very pivotal game as far as ACC standings go. And I do see Duke getting the win. I think I think our strengths match up well against their weaknesses, and I think we can exploit them. That's that's interesting. I, I I'm big on on the Hokies this year. There's a couple of reasons for that. One. The schedule. Again, sorry, I had to I had to breathe deep because I, I don't want to keep talking about it, but Vanderbilt, <laughs> Marshall, Old Dominion, Rutgers, Miami, Stanford, by week, Boston College, Georgia Tech, at Syracuse, Clemson at home. I'm sure that's going to be a night game, then a bye week, then Duke, and then UVA. I'm sure they're going to beat the tar out of their little brother to close the season. So... But it's That's always a, so funny when they don't. I have to say, it, it it's so funny when they don't. I, <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, UVA better sacrifice to to the old gods and the new gods. So <laughs> we'll see. Oh, the full pantheon, <laughs> right? Bring bring them all back. Go listen to the Cold and Mithras <laughs> episode on the Classical Antiquity Side Quest. Anyway, so that's a pretty favorable schedule. Blacksburg Chris is all excited about his boys down in Lane Stadium. And I will say this, though, about Pry is if you look at his first season there, there were a lot of close losses to Miami by six points, to NC State by one point, to Georgia Tech by one point. And next season, what did Virginia Tech do? Won enough of those games to go to a bowl. Five and three in conference, seven and six overall. Lost by a touchdown to a good NC State team. Lost by <coughs> lost by a touchdown to Purdue and a touchdown to Marshall. And then there was a quarterback switch, and the team really started to take off. They also had coordinators who I think moved from the FCS division up. And once they settled in, they started to cook. I think... I think Virginia Tech is going to beat Duke on November 23rd. Boy, I hope I am wrong because I will be you there with Homer. Now, uh, now I'm going to listen. All you listen, Virginians, all you Virginians, Jesus. Uh, Look, I'm going to be there with Blacksburg, Chris, and uh, he's going to want the Hokies to win. He may be enough to push them over the edge. We'll see. I don't know, but I've, I've got to go with the Hokies in that game. I think it's just going to be challenging for Duke. So you've got Duke at nine and three. Seven and four. Excuse me. Uh, let me correct that. I had that wrong. You have Duke at nine and two. I have the. I have Duke at seven and four. Closing the season out against Wake. I bet you we both picked the same on this one. But go ahead. <laughs> the Protestant Bowl. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. No, I. Not to take away from Wake. Um, you, you can't help but respect what Clawson's done there. Uh, I think this will be a pivotal year for them. You know, I it's you can have slumps. I mean, you know, you, you look at you look at the Cutcliffe era. Um, you know, you have a 2016 kind of year. 
um, that, you know, it was more of an accident than a, um, a indicator, indicator of an underlying, um, you know, series of symptoms. Um, you know, I, I, and you saw a resurgence uh, the next three years. Um, you know, I think Wake has the capacity to do that. I also think that, you know, Clawson has struggled when he didn't have a superstar quarterback. Um, I realize, you know, I, I say that as if it's a cutting edge thing. You know, it's pretty easy to win a football game when you have a superstar quarterback. But um, I think this year is going to be very determinate, determinative of Dave Clawson's caliber as the head coach. Um, more specifically, I think it's going to be very determinative of Dave Clawson's caliber as, a, you know, to put it directly, a football guy. Um, he's going to have to do a lot of coaching, a lot of, uh, you know, chess playing at the 30,000 foot level. Um, in situations like that, you sort of, you know, you, you, you want to be so in control that sometimes guys will make the mistake of starting to micromanage, which I think is also a, a, uh, dangerous issue as far as the dynamics of, you know, a football team, um, that said, I, I think Wake could bounce back this year. I don't think Wake is going to have one of their years where they're in the conversation for the ACC championship. So I think um, based off of, you know, physical mismatches, yeah, you know, I, I think, you know, the, you know, superior caliber of coaching will be on the side of, you know, from Durham. Um, and, I, you know, I think I, I just don't see much from Wake that scares me for this game. It's not going to be a blowout because it never is. Um, they're not one of those teams that just rolls over. But I think this is a standard probably 10, 14-point win for the Blue Devils. I'm going to take Duke as well. I think Wake's just in a transitional year. So I, I just don't see Wake winning this game. I know it's at Wake, but I just I don't I don't see the Blue Devils losing that one. So let me if, if I'm wrong, you've got Duke at 10 and 2. You're following the hope, optimism, and ball strategy of my dad. You're you're firmly in Richlandia. We'll find out uh, what his picks are. You might be ahead of him based on what he told me when we were down there visiting. But I have Duke at eight and four. I'm kind of ballparking in my mind Duke going about seven and five this year. But if it's eight and four, if, if Duke gets to seven wins and anything above that, I will be very happy. But let's let's do our Rich Landy a check in. We'll get a little preview of Elon, and we'll get his overall win loss prediction, and we'll do that now. Okay, so as promised, we are interrupting Lee to drop in a check in on Richlandia, the state of Richlandia, the sovereign sovereign independent republic of Richlandia, the home of the OG optimistic Duke football fan. And he is going to tell us what to expect for the first game of the season in which our beloved Blue Devils will battle Elon. And then we're going to get an overall win-loss prediction from him. So first off, uh, Dad, uh, you can't see this because you're actually calling in. But I did want to tell you today, Saturday, August 24th, Kobe Bryant Day, by the way, as we are recording this, I am wearing... Your father's watch, which you gifted to me, and I got working again with a new battery in it. And uh, I have informed your grandson that the watch will be his one day. He's very excited about it and appreciates it very much. Like most teenagers, though, he has promised to write you a thank you note. I would not hold your breath on a quick turnaround on that, though. Uh, much like most parents have to remind their children, although we don't have to do this with Mac, about summer reading. There's been a lot of, hey, remember you said you were going to do that thing? And he has not has not gotten to it, but I'm sure it will happen. As long as he understands his dad's cheap and batteries are extra, you'll have to pay for those. <laughs> you know, actually, what's funny about this is I got, so I took this to a jeweler because I wasn't sure if, I mean, people can't see it, but it's a, it's a Belova quartz watch. I wasn't sure if it was going to have to have any additional work done on it. And... They told me it would be ready by a certain date, and they completely whiffed on it. So they gave me the the battery replacement for free, which was fantastic. So it worked out great. 
Man, no comment. <laughs> I left okay, him a five star. You. I left him a five star review on Google, man. All right. Well, I'm just glad that, you know, good football season has rolled around. And once again, I can find something to be optimistic about because, frankly, your dad's just getting tired of going to doctor's appointments here this summer. But uh, <laughs> moving on. Uh, but if everybody wants to send out good thoughts, got another knee replacement coming up here uh, September 4th. Uh, any and all of those will be accepted uh, graciously. Um, fingers crossed for a good result again. Uh, so w what are we talking about? Elon, the Phoenix, is that correct? Yes. Well, let's see. Um, this one may sound a little different from what we normally do because, of course, you know, first game of the season. So not a lot to uh, talk about, definitely in terms of what they've done, uh, you know, the previous week. Uh, they're coming off a six and five season. They were six and two in the in their conference. Uh, they've got seven starters back on uh, uh, offense and eight on defense. So that that you know experience tends to bode well for success, assuming uh, you know the team uh, in question stays healthy and and the youngsters uh, you know are able to move in and to the right spots. But also we got this whole portal thing going on, um, which we'll talk about with them in just a second. But first of all, they have. Uh, Caleb Curtin coming back, who was all conference, uh, uh, first team defensive back, and uh, Chandler Brayboy, uh, honorable mention, a wide receiver, all conference. And man, a whole path full of transfers here uh, from North Carolina Central, uh, defensive back, uh, Kaylee uh, Baker, uh, and Rashawn Baker. I don't think these two are related from Bucknell at running back, and they really uh, need him because uh, they lost their. Uh, running backs uh, from last year. Uh, Brandon Smiley, a uh, defensive lineman from uh, uh, West Carolina. Um, go Catamount. Uh, Nathan uh, Kabambi, I think is how you say it, from Appalachian State, a defensive back. Uh, Tyler DeVera from New Mexico State, a tight end. And Jack Salopic uh, from Western Michigan, a quarterback. Um, they've made the FCS playoffs three times in the last seven years. Still looking for that first postseason win. And they're hoping to compete for their first conference title uh, in a long time, 1981, in fact. Um, returnees that would, you know, they're going to depend on a lot. And people that the Blue Devil defensive coordinator and players need to be focused on include senior quarterback uh, Matthew Downing. He was ninth nationally passing in SCS, uh, 1,915 yards, 19 touchdown passes. Uh, wide receiver Chandler Bray, a boy we just uh, referred to. Uh, 589 yards receiving, but he's got 1,610 for his career and 1,000 kickoff return yards, so we might not want to give him too many opportunities uh, to return kicks. Uh, Baker, the running back who's come in from Bucknell, has three-year totals of 1,359 yards and 15 touchdowns. Um, and Jamarian Dalton, who caught five touchdown passes, he's back. Tight end Tyler uh, Devera's back. Uh, four starters back on the offensive line, including Williams at center, who was a freshman All-American and an All-Conference uh, uh, 2022. Um, and defensively, uh, Curtin, a defensive back, uh, he had 80 total tackles, six and a half for loss, and four picks. So we might not want to throw too many over that way. Uh, Baker from North Carolina Central was the MEAC Defensive Player of the Year and first team All-American. Uh, so that's uh, undoubtedly going to give them one of the best safety combinations uh, around. Uh, the corners will be new, so that might be some places we can go to work uh, on offense. Uh, their linebackers returning are good. Uh, Patierno and Tyson, um, 68 total tackles and 73 respectively, nine and five uh, tackles for loss respectively. Uh, these guys were freshman All-Americans. Um, uh, that spur position, you know, that roving kind of defensive position a lot of teams have, uh, Powell, uh, is another good one for them. And defensive tackles are deep, deepest spot. They've got really three or four guys that would qualify as starters. Uh, probably have a chip on their shoulder, um, you know, with their out-of-conference schedule last year, probably keeping them out of the playoffs. Uh, they have received votes in the preseason, but they are not ranked in FCS. Uh, so they would like nothing better, I'm sure, than to knock off uh, a program like Duke in that first game. Uh, to have people, you know, talking about them in a serious uh, capacity. But they are probably one of the three or four teams you'd have to consider uh, for a conference, uh, regular season conference championship. 
in that conference. So, um, you know, I, I'm kind of probably, you know, these guys I, I haven't seen a lot of. I'm probably more worried about our Blue Devils. Unfortunately, I haven't been in camp. Uh, I was really hoping Grayson, he did such a great job last year, quarterback, you know, coming in in difficult circumstances. Uh, but the quarterback battle apparently has been a really uh, exciting one. I think they're going to go with the uh, Texas transfer, it looks like, at least in the opener. I suspect they'll both play a lot, uh, you know, if the opportunities present themselves during the season. Uh, the offensive line, according to Coach Diaz, has uh, been one of the pleasant surprises of uh, camp. Uh, sounds like those guys are uh, coming together as a unit. And, you know, they're experienced. We've been uh, into the portal there. We've got a couple of guys back. Um uh, we should be good in defensive secondary and maybe at linebacker as well. Uh, you know, we've got a couple of portal losses that I wish we hadn't had, uh, but we've you know brought some guys in that should be good. Uh, we should be strong at wide receiver. I think the running back uh, room is going to be pretty full again, um, you know, in spite of that a person who will remain nameless that went over to uh, Raleigh. Um, so it should be an interesting opening. Don't I, hate the guy I, I for getting hope, paid, man. Don't hate the guy for getting paid. I, I just hope we stay healthy. You know, that's always an issue because even if you have depth, sometimes it's not maybe the quality depth you'd like to have at certain positions. Um, but, you know, and we got, you know, like I said, good results in the portal, all things considered. I uh, got a pretty good recruiting class coming in. Uh, but, again, these are – what do we got now? Another coach that's uh, one, two, uh, three in the last, what, four years. So um, uh, it, it's a challenge. We've got some holdover from the coaching staff, which probably is really good uh, for, for a number of different reasons. Um, but, you know, I just I may not be quite as optimistic as last year in terms of my prediction uh, for the season. You know, I may drop down from 10 and 2 and just say 9 and 3. Uh, instead of 10 and 2. But again, injuries, you know, we'll see what happens. So 9, okay, 9 and 3. Now, full disclosure, that means that there, Mac Brown will return to the podcast this season. I'm trying to pull up that <laughs> message now. We had a debate going, uh, the, the over or under for, well, the over to get Mac to, to return here was 8.5 you had to get over 8.5 wins so you going with nine and three uh has booked mac brown well, to return I hate to be held responsible for uh mac brown coming coming back but <laughs> well I, I i mean everybody was shocked when i got mac to do it i mean i just am surprised that the administration cleared that interview bubba cunningham's a pretty savvy operator i thought they would have Shut that down, but I got to give credit from to Mac for coming on and, and answering a bunch of tough questions and being honest and straightforward. I, I appreciate it. But uh, so here's where you stand because you haven't heard the the interview yet, uh, obviously because it has not been posted, uh, which we're going to do now that we've got this recording done. We're gonna we're gonna edit that in and then finish it up. But but Lee went ten and two. I went eight and four with my win loss prediction, but I'm really thinking and and looking at it and considering all the stuff that happens during a football season, seven and five in my mind seems a lot more likely. So you're you're ahead. I just you're 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 ahead of me. You're behind Lee, and and I kind of feel like those Richlandia t-shirts that we made. Maybe I maybe I need to take yours away. Oh, I, I can't believe you would even say something like that. Uh, I, I'm curious. Uh, I think Coach Diaz might be one of those guys, you know, probably not as good at it as I was when I was coaching, but <laughs> uh, might have a little bit of a chip on his shoulder coming back to the conference and, you know, being let go from Miami when he had a winning record. Um, you know, although obviously that wasn't, you know, what the folks down there had hoped for with that hire. Uh, they were hoping for better in that time period that he was there. But it'll be interesting to see some of the changes uh, in defensive philosophy and how that plays out with the, uh, you know, with the talent and the personnel that we have, and also hopefully the offense. Um, you know, will will uh, you got to like our depth at quarterback, assuming the new guy uh, that's going to get the starting nod, uh, you know, plays well 
and takes advantage of this opportunity since he's transferred in. But I'll tell you what, I have no problem with Grayson coming in. He really impressed me as a you know true freshman coming in in difficult circumstances last year. Uh, obviously not flawless. Uh, uh, you make uh, you learn from making mistakes. Uh, but the kid did a pretty good job, I thought, overall under difficult circumstances. And it'll be interesting to uh, to see if we can get off to another good start and stay healthy enough to, you know, continue a, another good start a little further into the season uh, in case well, we, you know, get to that point where people are tired and hurt and those kind of things and, and, and have to, you know, get some replacements in there. But, uh, here, hey, but here, here's know? why, though. I think the shirt may need to come away. It says ten and two, Rich Landia ten and two, and 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 you're not well, living up to that. What? Yeah, that was, what? That what was one of my listeners year. calls the driving the driving pick because you know, well, not anymore, but it used to be you kept your hands at ten and two. I just this is concerning. This is concerning. Do we need to? I mean, consider a comité <laughs> or a guardianship for you. I mean, I well, I'm, I'm concerned. Like I said, Should I talk I to mom? I mean, a part of this might have to do, like I said, I've been going through uh, just those three. I've turned into a caricature of an old person uh, constantly going to the doctor here lately. And so maybe some of that is, you know, me trying to get my head together for another knee replacement and, and you know, some of the other <laughs> issues that have been going on. Uh, and maybe that's uh, just sort of uh, had an effect on me there. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I think anytime anybody – you know, wants to go to a place that makes them feel better about uh, Duke football. I think Richland is the place to go. We got plenty of room for them. And, uh, uh, you know, nine and three is, is nothing to uh, uh, to get upset about unless we end up being one of those teams that just ends up being 13 in the 12-team college football playoff. Then, yes, then I'm going to be upset uh, that I couldn't push them through a little further. But um, I, I, I can't. It's ridiculous for anyone to suggest uh, optimism, a symbol of optimism of Richlandia. Uh, in this case, the shirt uh, needs to be something that's uh, not permanent. Um, but, but I forgive you. Well, I don't want to get sued for false advertising. I like the never ending story and Troy, uh, Lionel Hutz. I just I don't want to end up in that in that position. So I I, I don't I don't know what to do with this. Football heads, I think any of these talking football heads that put hearing my prediction would realize, wow, that's pretty optimistic. This guy's full of hope and optimism and, you know, that other word that, you know, is a generic. Uh, uh, genius, uh, you can say it. It's right? fine. This is an adult <laughs> oriented podcast. Hope I mean, off. you heard my appearance on the. Uh... That's me, baby. Let's go do. Well, I mean, you 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 heard my appearance on the GA Scumbags podcast where I had some choice words for Florida State, and we can bring some of that energy here at the appropriate time. But all right, just just is to be clear, true, thinking of Florida State, who's going to kick off here in a little bit with Georgia Tech, is it true DJ is back in the ACC? I thought he was going to go uh, with his coach. <laughs> what do you mean? I, they were talking this morning. I, I thought I heard the guy say on uh, uh, the college football show this morning uh, that DJ was down in Florida State now. That that's correct. Yes, we're we're not really wow. breaking news here, though, Dad. No, I just uh, well, you know, it's kind of hard to keep up with all the transfers, to be honest with you. Let's say then the coaching changes. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, the thing that not to I don't want to take away their the the freedom of the players to move, but he goes out to Oregon state. He has a good year and then his coach leaves. And I can understand why he wants to move again because of that. It just, to, to your point, it, it is hard to keep up with all that. And I wonder what's going to happen with the portal going forward. Cause I don't want to see the athletes lose their ability. The students lose their ability to make decisions about where they go. You know, I think there's a, I think there's a conspiracy here. I think there's a plot for oh, people God. that, um, you know, put together college football programs, and you're going to have to have one now at all times to keep up with the changes. And I think that's what's going on here. This is uh, something that's being encouraged and implemented by these folks. So we'll all be constantly buying uh, the annual yearbooks and the programs. And just another case of the man just, you know, picking our pockets. What can I say? So they're like the wallet inspector. Is that what you're saying? 
Uh, that's one word for it. <laughs> There's I a do couple think, others, but yeah, I, I do think. Gosh darn carpet baggers. <laughs> I, I do think not to retread stuff that Lee and I talked about, but the tax on the fan element of the way college football is evolving is a little obnoxious. And I hope that a much more just and equitable system for the students can be created to not be going to fans through the, these collectives, though I do think that they that that's a good thing and it's helpful. Uh, it's there, so I think there's a that's, uh, I think there's a better way to do it. It's so funny that that's evolved now into a legal and vital part of what college athletics have become now. When that was the thing that used to be what got people put on probation. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's interesting. It makes me think of some some wise words from uh, well Dick Davenzio, whom I uh, got to meet on a couple of occasions, and uh, his efforts, you know, on behalf of college athletes uh, a long time ago. And unfortunately, of course, Dick left us all too soon. But um, it, it's just kind of interesting how that position has evolved and changed and become accepted uh, practice now. And, um, yeah, I, obviously I don't have some magic. I'm not Solomon. I don't have a magic answer for it. Um, but uh, I, I think we – I don't think we're through seeing this evolution. I think they're going to be – I think these super conferences will, will fall apart at some point and we'll have regional conferences again. Don't know if I'll be around to see it. But um, I just – the model right now just does not look like it's sustainable in its present form. And I just hope, like you suggested – we get to a model that's fair and equitable and sustainable and less chaotic and less changing. And, uh, you know, the fans, in spite of everything, are the people who drive this. And, uh, you know, especially with some of the physical dangers in the sport, um, you know, we need to uh, – it, it needs to go to a different place. I uh, just hope it can find that place quickly, and it is a good place for everybody. Well, we will wait and see because if we know anything, there is no reason to suspect that college administrators will screw this up. I have complete faith in them to be to be endowed with foresight and wisdom and justice. Uh, much like Solomon, uh, these folks are going to take care of things and, and do us right, he said sarcastically. So, so we'll see. All right. So I'm going to I'm going to have a separate call with mom later. Uh, this this non ten and two prediction worries me greatly. So <laughs> you're you're fortunate. I'm not like. Well, hey, you know, I'm thinking about our listeners. You know, we, we can't just be st go on stale. You know, and give them the same thing they expect every single time. And and they need to respect that these are honest. Uh, you know, predictions. You know, where this is it's not just the home of uh, hope, optimism, and balls. It's also home of. Uh, the reality that sometimes we can only expect to win nine instead of 10 during a 12 game regular season. Uh, I mean, I don't think you need to worry about it ever going below nine. And this is probably the only time you'll ever hear that. I'm hoping next year I can go, you know, 11, one, 12 and oh, but you know, we'll see. 11 and one, 12. So next year you, that's, that's a possibility is what you're saying. Well, like I said, you know, Diaz wasn't my first pick, and I'm not going to go into who else. I'm all on board as usual. Uh, but we'll see how his second trip through the conference uh, goes and how the things that he likes to do on, um, you know, offense and defense and so on, um, how it fits in with the current personnel and the personnel that he will bring in. And, um, you know, as, as usual, I, I'm excited. The program is in – such a different place mentally uh, from where it was, uh, you know, three years ago. And, uh, you know, the talent level is good and uh, the preparation seems to be good and the expectation, um, you know, the, the, the kids expect to succeed. And, um, and boy, that's a big part of the battle. And uh, just, but like I said, it's a new, a new situation. And, uh, but the kids seem pretty excited and enthused again. So, uh, you know, I, 
we'll check in again, you know, pretty soon if we get to another four or five and zero start. Uh, you know, I may have to upgrade that prediction, and that's I'm fine with that. Well, like like I learned, there are time zero decisions, and then there are time later decisions. And so you make a decision today. It may be different down the line as you get more information. So I like that you're not ruling out 10 and 2 here. That makes me feel a little more comfortable and a little less concerned about yeah. your overall mental health and, and intellectual yeah, well-being. We stay healthy. We stay healthy. Uh, I, my biggest concern is that we don't turn into one of those programs sometimes with the because uh, apparently the competition at quarterback was very, very close very, very difficult for the coaches to make a decision. I just hope we don't end up in one of those uh, situations that some teams find themselves in from time to time with multiple quarterbacks and maybe no one clearly above the other. And, uh, you know, it ends up being detrimental to overall team performance. I don't think that'll be the case, but, you know, we've all seen it happen before with different teams from time to time. Um, And uh, I'm just – uh, excited about this first game. Uh, at least I'll be uh, <laughs> unmedicated before the surgery. I get to see the first one clearly. Uh, might be uh, not quite so clear for game number two, uh, but I'll do my best uh, getting us ready uh, for that look at our second opponent. Okay, so here's where we are. Then uh, I'm, I've got to I've got to cut this one short because Will, your other son, and my brother just called. And I wonder what he needs. So I got to figure this out, not to cut you short <laughs> or anything. But uh, thank you for the check in. At you know, which, what? he's probably just checking in to see, you know, what kind of special thing y'all might ought to do for me to, you know, as a little surgery gift or something. You know, maybe a, you know, surprise uh, tickets or you know, it could be a car, any number of things. That's probably what it's about. I wouldn't worry. Didn't he just take you to <laughs> to New Zealand? I mean, I. Oh, well, we need to do a whole episode on New Zealand, man. Went to Hobbiton. Oh, it was great. Yeah, All right. Wonderful. Well, we'll, 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 we'll I'll, I'll talk to Will and then we'll see what, what he was getting at there. So we're, we'll figure that okay. out. And I enjoyed the check in. you and the grandkids. <laughs> okay. I enjoyed the check in uh, on Richlandia. We'll follow, we'll follow up again and see where the mood of Richlandia is come Northwestern and I'll get you the number so you can call in and leave the voicemail. Rip them up, tear them up, give them hell Duke. All right, go Duke. (laughs) Bye, son. After we finish the call, Dad texted in with his score prediction, which we did not get to. He is taking in week one, Duke, Elon. He's going to take the Blue Devils by a score of 31 to 14. Didn't want to leave that one out. Okay, Lee, so Manny Diaz, Coach of the Year for you, all sorts of Duke first team honors, all ACC, national awards possible. You've got you got the Blue Devils doing really, really well this year, and I appreciate you coming back on the podcast. You know the drill, man. You come on, you answer all my questions. I'm going to give you a chance to have an open mic, so the floor is yours. Of course. Well, I, I always appreciate it. You know how much I enjoy this. Um, I, I, I ne- I'm not ever sure why you uh, – you know, think my opinion's worthy enough of having me back on, but I'm always grateful for it because it makes me feel like I've, you know, not quite as old as I, you know, know in my heart that I am. Um, but uh, it, it always is a genuine pleasure. Um, and, you know, I think the world of you, uh, you know, I, I will say a lot of this year will, will, will turn on, a, you know, a few key factors. The first one to keep an eye on is, um, you know, we've not seen a lot of Malik Murphy. Uh, you know, we, we, we know a lot about him, um, because he's a high caliber recruit, you know, there's all kinds of film from high school. Um, we've only seen him in two games and, you know, as with, I, you know, transfers from big schools can go one of two ways. They can be great, um, when given the chance to shine or they can go the Chase Bryce route. Nothing against Chase. I've heard he's a great guy. Never met him, but you know, all of, all of my teammates that played with him said they thought the world of him. And I have no doubt that, that that's the case. But um, as you, you know, as you could tell when he got to Duke, he was not used to um, being able to throw to guys who weren't the best athletes on the field. Um, I think Duke's got a really respectable core of tight ends and wide receivers. I think, you know, we, we're going to have to have some guys step up at running back this year, especially depth wise. I think we've got a good cast of characters on the offensive side of the ball. 
but it's going to come down to is whether or not Malik Murphy um, is a true quarterback or whether or not in the, you know, Chase Bryce, Jimmy Clausen style, he's more of a him thrower where, you know, you, you watch him and rather than go through his reads or, you know, more, you know, more, you know, give lip service to going through his reads, you can tell he sort of knows where he's going before the ball gets snapped. Um, that's going to have a lot to do with the trajectory this year. I'm very optimistic because I think our coaching is great. And I think, you know, it, when you look at the way Malik approaches the game, he, he comes across as a guy who takes a very holistic approach. Um, you know, you don't, he, he doesn't seem like a guy that does that, that, you know, skimps on his homework. Um, you know, and, and he certainly has the physical gifts to be able to be a, you know, game changing quarterback. And I think he, the fact that he chose Duke when, when he could have gone so many places, lends itself to him being the kind of, you know, cerebral football player that could really make the most of that position and continue the tradition of Duke quarterbacks that have gone on to respectable NFL careers. Um, I think the other thing to keep an eye on is uh, what did Manny Diaz learn from his first stint as head coach? Um, I, I think, you know, just interacting with him in the limited in the couple of limited scenarios I have, he comes across as also a very a, a more cerebral guy. Um, you know, you 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 certainly to a degree have to be to to be a, you know, as good a defensive coordinator as he is. Um, just by nature of the game, you know, you're not calling your own plays, you're you're scheming not only your your own system, but also in response to every move that you can you can possibly imagine the other side making. So you know, defensive coordinators are are, are pretty darn intelligent um, by nature. And you know, whereas a lot of times, as you saw with Diaz in the first iteration of his you know head coaching career, um, aside from his two weeks at Temple, um, the uh, Fun, fun fact, I, one of my best friends from high school played at Temple, and he said they had one team meeting with Diaz, and then he was not their coach anymore. Um, but anyway, um, you know, I, I, I think there's a lot of chance of upside here. And I, and I think if you look at, you know, there's a lot of defensive coaches who sort of fail at the head coach level for lack of, I think, understanding of offense to the extent they can make sure it's being effectively coached. Diaz strikes me as a guy who really could be one of those guys who has such a holistic grasp of the game that he could, you know, transcend to that next level of, um, you know, coaching hierarchies. You know, there's a lot of great offensive coaches. I would venture to say that it is slightly easier to be a good offensive coach. I think the great coaches, the truly great coaches are defensive primarily if you look at the most common um, underlying factors, uh, Nick Saban, defensive guy, Bill Belichick, defensive guy, um, Lloyd Carr, defensive guy, um, you know, Ted Roof, great example of a defensive guy, great, who's a great coordinator, but, you know, again, had lack of knowledge on the other side of the ball that didn't allow his, you know, Duke teams to transcend to, you know, beyond just being good schematically. So, um, I think, you know, you're at a place where uh, Diaz's approach to the game meshes a little bit better with the locker room than it may have at Miami. Um, you know, obviously Penn State is, you know, as as bright lights and big stage as you can get, but there also is a sort of, I think, different approach to, um, you know, Big Ten, big time football compared to what it may have been in South Beach. Um, and I think if you see the way that, that, that Diaz, the the places Diaz has had the most success in his career, there there are certain undertones to the culture that Duke, um, you know, makes possible, and so I think there's a lot of reason to be cautiously optimistic. But we are certainly going to have to see, and there's a lot of key people that are going to have to show some tangible growth. Um, that said, going to pull for him regardless. You know, going to be posted up wherever I, you know, the general admission winds below me this year. Uh, and we'll be very excited to see what the Blue Devils put on the field in Wallace Wade. And that said, and uh, anyone who knows me is not going to be shocked by this, it's election year. Make sure you're registered. Check your registration more than once um, and, and make sure it says that you're an active voter. No matter where you are, no matter who you are, no matter what you're doing, no matter what office it is, get out and vote. 
learn what uh, your local officials do, because more often than not, your mayor makes a bigger impact on your life than your president does. Um, that's, you know, whatever party you are, the classic adage is incredibly true. No matter who you vote for, it matters that you vote. This country is at best when we have great levels of engagement. Um, and it makes, you know, every party, it makes every politician, it makes every community better the more people participate in the civic life of our country. So do be sure that you take that you don't pass up the greatest gift we all have as Americans, and that's the right to free and fair elections. Lee, that is very inspiring. Thank you so much for coming back on. What a great message. Let's all get behind the Blue Devils this season. Let's let's go all in, man. Let's get to 10 and 2. Go to the site, go to the T Public account, buy the hope, optimism, and balls with Shalandia 10 and 2 shirts. Let's make it happen. Rock out at Wallace Wade with a couple of those. Let's see it occur. Guys, keep keep listening. Stay tuned. You know where to find us. We're everywhere you get your podcast. Check us out on our website, bullcitycoordinators.com. Send us a message on Twitter. Our DMs are open. I can't wait to be back in Wallace Wade with you guys this year. I'm looking forward to a great season, the start of the Diaz era. Really excited about it. So let me just say, as always, go Duke. Go Duke. <laughs>